Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Government 101. Um, so, you know, this is a very small session. It's going to be a great session because it's going to be very intimate. My name is Irma Diaz Gonzalez. I am president and CEO of a company called Employment and Training Centers. We do staffing, recruitment, and uh, emplacement. I um, have been in business for about 30 years, actually a little over 30 years. The objective of this morning's session is to provide you with timely, relevant, actionable advice on how to grow your business. And as a result of your participation today, you can expect to receive information on resources, practical solutions, best practices, and expert assistance from our panel today on a broad range of government contracting and other challenges. We will allow approximately 45 to 50 minutes for the panel, and it will be followed by 10 to 15 minutes of um, uh, you asking the panel questions. Uh, so first, let me introduce um, our distinguished panel. We have Stephanie Murphy, right here, Stephanie. Um, she is the owner and principal of Alpha Space Test and Research Alliance. Founded in 2015, the company provides science research access in the space environment using a privately owned laboratory at the International Space Station. And here's an interesting fact. She is the first and only woman business in the International Space Station. Ms. Murphy is also the principal owner and executive chair of the board of MEI Technologies, a company that provides comprehensive technical and management services in engineering, space access, modeling and simulation, information technology, and cybersecurity. Prior to this role, she served as deputy chief executive officer for MEI, leading the 700 plus person company along with the CEO and then as vice chairman of the board since 2012. She serves on the board of managers for AM Biotechnologies, Diosa Procurement. She's an ambassador to Leadership Texas and a member of the Johnson Space Center Joint Leadership Team. She holds a, an executive uh, master's of business administration degree from Texas A&M University. Welcome, Stephanie. Next, we have uh, Paula Mendoza. Uh, Paula is the president and CEO of Possible Missions. The company specializes <coughs> in project management and procurement solutions in a variety of industries, including higher education, medical, construction, and general business. The company operates in various states throughout the United States. Ms. Mendoza currently serves on the University of Houston System Board of Regents her business has achieved significant accolades over the years, including the Minority Business Enterprise Accountability Award, Supplier of the Year, and the Emerging 10 Award. Ms. Mendoza was named as one of Houston's 50 Women of Influence and was one of 2016's Women of Distinction. She is the past chair of the Texas State Ethics Commission, a past member of the Texas Board of Public Accountants and the past chair of the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce and currently serves on the boards of the Houston Minority Development Council and the East End Chamber of Commerce Foundation. She earned her bachelor's degree in criminal justice from the University of Houston downtown. Great to have you, Paul. Next, we have Mr. Tim, uh, Tim Scarborough. He is a procurement advisor with 30 years of experience in government contracting. In his current position as a program director for the University of Houston's Procurement Technical Assistance Center, he educates and guides individuals in selling their goods and services to federal, state, and local government through one-on-one -on -one advising, educational workshops, and outreach events. Prior to his current position, Tim was a small business owner, leading and managing procurement programs for the Department of Defense <coughs> domestically and internationally. 
He also served 24 years in the Air Force, with the majority of his time spent in the contracting career field. Welcome, Tim. In addition, um, we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us Valerie Coleman with the U.S. Small Business Administration. And uh, due to a, a minor glitch, she's going to be doing her own introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and since everyone was said it, we're, we're singing, I will stay um, in my chair. Um, I have, um, well, how do I start this? I have been with SBA 46 years all in government contracting. Um, I was a procurement center rep station at Johnson Space Center for 16 years, and now I'm the national program manager for the Prime Contracts Program out of Washington, D.C., headquarters for SBA. But I'm very fortunate that when I got the job, they said you can stay in Houston. So um, I get to do it, I get to do it here. Um, I have oversight over the procurement center reps, which is what I was. So I have oversight over all of them. I also have oversight over our size program, our certificate of competency program, surveillance reviews of federal agencies, and our natural resources program. Um, I won't go into some of the stuff that I've been very fortunate to have been given to me except for a few. I did receive a commendation from President Clinton on the White House for a uh, conference on small business. And just recently I was named um, at the procurement forum, the humanitarian of the year, which I'm very, which I'm very proud of. So uh, I have worked with all three of these individuals um, for the last uh, 19 years in some capacity since I've been here in Houston. I moved down here from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, where I worked in the SBA's 8A program, and then before that in Kansas City, where I got my start. So that's a brief. Thank you, Valerie, for helping just so that I get a feel for who is in the room, can you raise your hand if you're a business owner, a small business owner? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, so in that, um, uh, we're going to start with, uh, with a question. I, I guess I'm going to pause it, I'm going to pass it to Paula. What is the most important factor to consider when starting a business? So when I was reading over these questions, I took those because I just got through reading a, a MBE, it's an MBE entrepreneurial book, and it was talking about what you do when you start a business, and it really all resonated. So uh, it's a friend of ours, Ed Ryland, who, from the Houston Minority Business Council that just wrote this book, and I kind of jotted my notes down, and the things that you need to remember, and most of you that have a business already will probably go back to when you started and think about it, but sometimes we don't realize it till after 15 or 20 years after we've had our business, but I think the three main things really are stay focused about your business, not what you're selling or your service or the product, but keep your eye on the ball. I guess as a business owner, as a CEO, people think, oh, I'll hire a financial guy to help me, or I'll hire an accountant, and I'll do this and do that, and you just go on with your daily business. Stay in tune with what's going on in your daily books, uh, in your business, and with your clients. So stay focused on your company, employees, Take care of your employees as much as possible because if you think about it, they're the ones making money. That's the way I also look at it. And sometimes they even become family, kind of a, your business family, and stay focused on your clients. So the second thing is stay connected. We were down in the networking thing this morning about the marketing, and they were talking about staying connected as, as well. Marketing your company, but, but relationships and networking. I know you could go to something every night of the week two times on Saturdays and twice on Sunday. There's something going on. Pick and choose, but stay involved. Whether it's your trade organization, whether it's a minority business council, it's an SBA, stay involved because what you're doing is establishing relationships. And I have found that there have been some people that I met 15 years ago at the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. They're now my CPAs or they're my financial advisors. Some didn't necessarily equate to making, business, making money in my business, but it was how to take care of my business, or who had my back, if you would say. Because you've made friends, you've established relationships. So network and stay connected. And the third one I would say is, then stay true to your product and your service. If it's selling a product or if it's a service, make sure that that's what you focus on and you make that your core, your business and what you're intending to do. 
Don't stray and do a million other things. As small businesses, sometimes we think, I'll take it because I'm not making any money or I'm not getting any invoices in the door, no, no payment. So we all do it and you're gonna continue to do that. Just remember to come back to that core and sell your business, sell your core, product, service, or what the, whatever that is. Just remember that. I know we have to get a little money in the door every once in a while, but at the end of the day, remember what that is so that you can, again, stay connected and your relationships all focus on what your core business is. Thank you, Paula. Valerie, do you have anything to add there? Now I'm starting the business. I'm more along the lines of after you've already got it started, yeah. now what do you do with it? Right. So. Okay. <laughs> but, um, okay, so Stephanie. Uh, yeah, so I um, started a couple of businesses and I've purchased a business and I've sold a business. So I've Excellent. kind of seen all ends of the spectrum. Some of those I inherited. My dad actually started MEI Technologies 27 years ago, so I bought that from him a couple years ago and some were uh, fresh startups. But sort of along the lines, what she was saying, um, stick to your business. But one thing I, I would recommend to everybody is when you're starting your business, you have to build a champion for yourself. And that's more than just networking and exchanging business cards. Um, it really starts sort of with the concept of reciprocity, right? I'm gonna do something for you and you're gonna do something for me and we're gonna benefit each other mutually and if we can benefit someone else along the way, that's even better. But um, I really, I've done it with customers. You go in and you start meeting with them. You discover what their needs are. And one of the things my uh, dad always taught me was, you know, in the concept of reciprocity, it's give and take, but be the first to give. If you can give first, give first. So that applies to business and to service and community give back. But that's, a, that's sort of a different topic. Um, but when you're working with your customers, if you can start to uh, bring them solutions that they need or connect them with other people who can bring them solutions It may not always be your business But if you can partner with someone else to bring them a solution, then it really helps you um, Build a champion for yourself um, In that regard the other way that I've done it and you can kind of coin it whatever you want to call it but um, building a champion, finding a mentor, um, however you want to phrase it. But early in the start of my company, I, I do business in the aerospace industry, which is a lot of bright old white men. I am just gonna, you know, I'm gonna just sort of say it. And I needed someone to help bring credibility when I was meeting with people who I had never met before. And so um, one of my mentors, it just sort of developed that way, he was an older white, aerospace engineer and I met with him a lot and I told him about the vision I had and we worked together and so I would ask him hey can you make this connection for me I want to talk to this person I don't know that they'll give me the time of day but if you introduce me they may take a few a few minutes to meet with me or I would invite him along come Sam Boyd, Sam right? Boyd yeah. come on Sam have a free lunch with me and I'm gonna meet with this person I want you to come along to lunch because it just gives credibility to what you're doing when you're a little bit of an unusual suspect in the beginning, um, especially in an industry that may be male-dominated. Uh, so that's just something along the line of okay. starting up. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask Tim, what do you think is the most important area that small businesses need to focus on when developing a plan of business with government? Sure, thank you. Obviously, there are lots of things that you need to take in consideration when you're developing a business plan to do business commercially as well as trying to increase your revenue by doing business with government. But two things I like to highlight that you need to focus on if you're looking to do business with government is gaining an understanding of who buys your goods and services and how they buy your goods and services. Of course, if you learn an agency doesn't buy your goods and services, you want to move on. You don't want to waste your time with them, okay? But in regard to understanding who buys, there are various ways you can go about doing this. Some government agencies make publicly available systems that you can go into and do some level of research. For example, with the federal government, you got the federal procurement data system, or you've got usaspending.gov. I call those door openers, because while you can do data research through them, they, in some cases, don't always provide the complete answer for you. And I use the analogy that it opens the door and then it's up to you to either open it all the way or close it and move on to the next one.
So how do you open that door up all the way? That's where the second phase comes in that you should think about incorporating into your business planning. And that's understanding how to develop a market outreach plan to go out and interact with government officials, whether it's the buyers, whether it's the small business representatives. And just for your awareness, most government agencies at local, state, and federal have small business representatives who are there for you. Or if you're fortunate enough to get in and talk to the actual end user who has the money and has the needs, certainly you want to take advantage of that as well too. What I often see with, with small businesses or hear from small businesses in regard to marketing outreach, one of their area of emphasis is on their certifications, socio and economically disadvantaged small business certifications. And there's a perception that that's going to guarantee you a contract. And I can tell you that that is not necessarily the case. Certainly we encourage you to get your certifications. They're important and they provide value to you. But from a government buyer's perspective, that's not the, at the top of their priority list. They have goals to meet, certainly, and they work to meet their goals in those areas. But their priority is meeting my mission, meeting my objective, fulfilling my customer's requirement. And so what they want to hear from you, I, I group it into three core areas. Your first one is your value proposition. So some of you were in here at the earlier presentation before this one and you heard this value proposition <clears throat> value proposition is not your certifications it's the way you communicate with somebody about the goods and services you offer that they can hear what you're saying what you're articulating to them helps them come to a determination that yes you are somebody who could provide value to my objective <coughs> or what i'm trying to fulfill so you need to be able to put together your elevator pitch or whatever form you're doing this in, whether it's in writing or your capability statement, if you're familiar with capability statements. What is your value proposition to them? What can you do for them to help meet their objective? Second, you have to prove it. You have to prove your value. It's easy to communicate and have somebody uh, want to believe you, but you have to give them reason to believe you. And in government procurement, the primary way that you prove your value is through past performance, okay? And you have to have that information readily available. Again, this is something you articulate verbally. This is an area that is <coughs> demonstrated in your capability statement. But you have to articulate how you can provide that value to them through your past performance. And finally, differentiators. What sets you apart from your competitors? I can tell you that there's a lot of competition in government contracting, even in those areas where requirements are set aside or reserved exclusively for those certification programs, there is lots of competition in those categories. And having sat on the government side and evaluated quotes, bids, and proposals before, I can tell you there's a lot of blurriness between a lot of them. There's objective criteria that obviously are stipulated in the solicitation that they objectively evaluate you on, but there's also subjective criteria that comes into play as well too. And if they can find in your quote bidder proposal, your offer, those unique differentiators that set you above your competitors, you can find that will be the ma main difference for winning or losing a contract award. So your value, prove it to them, and what sets you apart via differentiators is there's some things you need to think about when you're looking to do business planning for doing business with the government. That's great. Having done business with uh, local government for the last 30 years or so, I can really <laughs> attest to the fact that the areas that you're bringing up are definitely um, right on target. Valerie, you want to add to that? So I'm going to bring you down to the lowest level. Um, because I'm going to make an assumption that you're in here because you want to do business with the government um, and you haven't done it in the past. So I'm a federal employee, so I'm going to be talking from the federal government standpoint. The great thing about having Tim in here is that the organization that he belongs to, the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, or PTAC, can help you on all levels, federal, city, state. So that's great, so you have one source. But I want to talk to you just on the federal side of it about what you need to do. And everything that everyone said is great, but you have homework you have to do before you even think about doing business with the government. 
and that starts with your basic registrations and everything else that you have to do. Uh, we have a database in the federal government called SAM, the System for Award Management, SAM. Uh, you have to be registered in there, not necessarily to bid on a federal contract. You can bid on federal contracts all you want, but if you're not in SAM, we can't award it to you. <coughs> so, bless you. So you need to be in in SAM. The PTAC can assist you with that database. We have a database that belongs to SBA called the Dynamic Small Business Search. Only small businesses are in that. When federal agencies are looking for small businesses, that's where they go to find them. They go to that database. You have to be aware of the terms that each of the level of government uses. And let me give you a prime example. In the federal government, we do not use the term minority. That is a state term. That is a city term. The federal government uses the term disadvantaged. And the reason we do that is because disadvantaged does not necessarily mean minority or an ethnic background. So if you want to do business with the federal government and you say, I'm a minority, they're going to say, we don't do business with minorities. We do business with disadvantaged firms, which can get back into ethnic background. So you can see that while we would like to be consistent through all the levels, we're not. So you have to know where you, who you want to do business with. And one of the things that Tim was starting to talk about, um, your values in the whole bit, getting more into that, most small businesses don't start out doing business directly with the federal government. Well, because you don't have a track record. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, well, let me say this. Boeing, possible missions, MEI, all started with their first one. So everybody started with your first contract. But here's one of the things the government can do. Let's say that you were a staffing company and you're just starting, but you worked for a staffing company for 25 years. So you've got personal hit past performance that the government can take into effect. But what I'm saying is most small businesses don't start working directly with NASA. They work with an MEI, or they work with a Boeing, or they work with a Lockheed Martin as a subcontractor to get that experience. And getting that experience working with a federal prime contractor is very important because it shows that you've gotten used to the rules, you understand the lingo, and trust me, we are acronym crazy in the federal government. Um, we normally do not even talk in regular language when we're, when we're, when we're talking. I remember I used to come home to my husband and I go, he go, how was your day? Oh, we had this RFP and we did, then we did this IFB and I had to do a COC on it. And he goes, I am not understanding a <laughs> single thing of what you're talking about. Does that mean you need to understand what all of that means? No. Okay. You have to be familiar with it. The PTAC is a great source. Let me just, I'm putting in a plug, he'll talk about it, but I'm putting in a plug because I do a lot of work with the PTACs. I teach a lot of classes for them and things of that nature. How many of you guys in here pay taxes? <laughs> Your taxes pay for this. You've already paid for this service. 99.9% .9 of everything they offer you is totally free to you. So if you want to do business with the federal government or the state or the city, why wouldn't you go to a place that offers you free service that can help you get started, get on the databases, get you to understand what's going on, have classes that can be taught so you can understand the process, look at your proposals, they're not gonna to talk to you about your prize, but make sure you cross the T's, dotted the I's, and I always add, as one of his former consultants say, dot the J's, because people forget about J's need to be dotted. <laughs> and so, what you need to do is you can't start at the college level. You've got to start at pre-K. Do the pre-K stuff. I, I just wanted to make a comment because Valerie's so right. So even MEIT, we've been in business 27 years. I still take courses at the Small Business <laughs> Development Center. And I personally go and take, I was there last year taking a course on QuickBooks because I have another startup and we're using QuickBooks and I wanted to understand um, how we could get our system set up the right way, so I went with my bookkeeper. 
So I cannot emphasize enough the value of the Small Business Development Center and PTAC specifically if you want to do government contracting. Um, and those, co those courses are so valuable and the regulations change. So accounting <laughs> yes. is the business yeah. of language, but the FAR is the business of federal contracting. And if you want to stay up to date, those regs change all the Every time. Day. So I see Valerie, and I have seen Valerie pretty regularly for <laughs> years now. And every time I see her, I learn something new. And today, I think she's going to talk about a few new um, women-owned. It's just one. It's just it's just one one proposed rule. <laughs> <laughs> one. Okay. So before that, you have something to add to? Well, I just want to clarify: we're not 99.9% .9 free. We are 100%. <laughs> 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 well, see, <laughs> we don't we don't, the we don't have charge. Small fees. This not the PTAC courses. Not the PTAC. In fact, right. uh, the SBDC, and just to but differentiate, so the Small Business Development Center is an SBA program, Small Business Administration program, a resource partner with the PTAC that we're teamed together with to support small business. The PTAC, we're not an SBA program, we're actually a defense logistics agency program, and so we have two different cooperative agreements we operate under, and yes, the SBDC does charge a small nominal fee to attend their workshops, but effective February 1st of this year, we, we used to charge, we went absolutely free on See, everything that we something offer. I just yeah. learned right. today so. also. And we told you we were going to learn the practical resources <laughs> right here. Paula, you have something so to So I was add? just getting, oh, getting chugging about from Valerie's remarks, uh, is that I've had my business 19 years, and just probably about a month or so ago, one of my executives went to the PTAC again because we needed to get updates, we needed to find out what are we not doing here? We split our company and those kind of things. Use those resources. I mean, because they're free, yes, but because that's what they're experts in, and it can take you days and months. Your attorneys probably won't even be able to tell you what they teach you. No. And I'm serious, right? Yeah, right. Because they, they're they not don't specially right. specialized they don't in that. Contract and law. you need that. Just I had it in my Just notes. You need a CPA, a, what I say, a finance person, and an, attor an attorney. The other one is, is if you're going to be certified at whatever level, know who your representative is and know them. And know them on a first name basis and get them to know you on a first name basis. Because I don't know how many times we've called on Valerie or our SBA regional person. You have to have them understand what you're doing so they can help you. So, okay. How do we find SP Tech? P Tech? P Tech. Com? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. University of Houston. It's yes. www. PTAC, Procurement Technical Assistance Center is what it stands for, .uh.edu, www.ptac.uh.edu. We do require you submit an online application. We have to have the application on file before we can meet with you. We provide services to 32 counties surrounding the greater Houston area. The eligibility for our program is that you have to at least be in business. I'm sure most of you know the basic form of business in the state of Texas is a sole proprietorship. Of course, if you get up to LLC, S Corp, C Corp, or partnership, that's all well and good too, but you have to be in business and you have to be located in our 32 county service area. If you're not in our service area, don't fret. There are eight P tacs in the state of Texas. We all work on geographic location, and there's a, if you're not even in the state of Texas, there's one in every state now. So we are a federal government program, and our core mission is to educate and guide you on how to sell your goods and services to federal, state, and local government. As Valerie said, the SBA is primarily, or is, in the federal space. Our advisors can help you in all three areas. Now, one, one other thing I'd like to piggyback on, and, and we get a lot of questions on this, and as soon as it was, I mentioned it earlier, and Valerie mentioned it, I see the expressions on the face, and that's past performance. We get, a, a, our services are free, right? So you can imagine, <coughs> We see clients that have been in business for one day up to those that have been in businesses for several years. And a preponderance of the clients we work with are the ones that are startups, the ones that haven't been in business very long. And we see some that think government contracting is the panacea, and it can be, it can be, don't get me wrong. But we always advise, don't. Don't think it's something that you want to put all your eggs in one basket and pursue government contracting. It is a opportunity to increase your revenue, but you should always be looking <laughs> to grow commercially. I think that's a common sense statement that everybody agrees with. 
Now, past performance does not have to be government contracting exclusively. It can be the same commercial experience. What they're looking for is the apples to apples comparison. What they're wanting you to do, buy from you, goods or service, construction we call it in the service area as well, versus what you've done commercially, it equates. The other thing they're looking for is magnitude. If the estimate of this project over here is 250,000, do you have experience doing projects of that magnitude, wherever it may fall within there? If you don't have past performance, in the federal government, it does not make you ineligible to submit an offer. You can submit an offer. They are, uh, the regulation, uh, uh, mentioned the FAR, which is Federal Acquisition Regulation, says they're to rate you neutrally. Doesn't mean you cannot win a contract. I've seen clients who have been in business only a couple of weeks win contracts. Now, in many cases, it's related to selling goods. It can be a little bit more challenging if you're a service provider because they do more analysis and you're required to submit more information for a service provider. But even then, it doesn't mean you can't win, okay? So I would encourage anybody, even if you want to just learn more about it, come in and sit and, and talk to an advisor to see if government's for you. Because we get a lot of clients that we sit down and we talk about the steps it takes to get from point A to point B. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. It is, yes. it is an effort to get from point A to point very B. Very extensive. We get yes. some clients that say, thank you very much, but that's not for me. I'm happy over in my little comfort zone. But we get a lot of them that say, yeah, I'm willing to put forth the effort. I want to increase my revenue by pursuing government contracts with local, state, or federal, and we help you get through to point A to point B through a series of meetings to do that. So staying in the same vein, uh, and just to change the topic a little bit, um, Valerie, you've been with the federal government for 30, 40 years. 46. 46 <laughs> years, okay. So well, i got to get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share with us three or four pillars of what the successful businesses do that, that keeps them in that, um, um, I guess, things that are key uh, to keep them uh, uh, getting contracts? The first thing is, and I, and I said this at the very beginning, you have to do your homework. You have to do everything that you need to do to get started. There is nothing worse than a small business who comes into me that wants to do business with the federal government, and I say, well, so you're registered in SAM, you're registered in Dynamic Small Business Search, you're registered at, at FBO, and they go, I have no idea what you're talking about. That just tells me off that you are not ready to do business with the federal government. So. One of the first things I say is make sure you're ready, okay, and do your homework. Go see the PTAC. Get all that set up so when you go in, because to talk to a Johnson Space Center, and as Tim was saying, every federal agency by law has to have a small business specialist, and that's the person you're going to interact with first. The first thing they're going to say is, are you registered in SAM? Are you registered in FBO? Et cetera. If you come in and say no, they're going to send you on your way. So don't even allow them to say no. Go in there and say, I'm in SAM, I'm in this. Here's my capability statement. If you don't know what a capability statement is, I have a blog. Tim has information. One page, front only, tells us everything we need to know about you. Um, so the, the thing is, be prepared, OK? Understand who buys your product. Everyone in the Houston area wants to sell to Johnson Space Center. Johnson Space Center doesn't buy everything. It could be NASA buys it, but it could be Kennedy or Goddard or Ames or JPL. It could be a different Space Center. Maybe NASA doesn't buy it at all, but the Galveston Corps does or the VA does or the IRS does. So that's part of your homework. Know who buys. The third thing is you have to know your product. We don't know it. So when, we, when you come in to, to market your business, you have to know the answers to those questions. How long, Paula, how long will it take us to get this product you're selling? If she looks at this, I have no idea. That doesn't help. If you order it by two, you can get it tomorrow. Right. So <laughs> here's the thing I always tell my small businesses when I talk to them. What you want to do is you want to under-promise and over-deliver not the other way around. If you know it's going to come in on Tuesday, tell them it'll come in Thursday, they'll still be happy, and it comes in for Tuesday, they're ecstatic. Okay? 
When you get a government contract, get in there, do it, do the paperwork, get out. We want you to give us a fair price, uh, we want you to be competitive, and we want you to do a good job. Just like, you know, when Hurricane Harvey comes in, you know, and you've got damage to your house. You want your house fixed, you want a competitive price, you want it done right. We want the same things. I will tell you this, there is a lot of paperwork. There is red tape. If you don't like filling out forms, then you don't need to be doing business with the government. But whether it's a $10,000 contract or a $10 million, the forms are basically all the same. So once you get used to them, it's like, okay, I know what this form is. We're here to help you. The one thing you cannot do, and I really want to emphasize this, if you start working with the federal government or you start wanting to work and you get with the PTAC and you do your registrations, you are going to start getting emails by the dozens. And these will be people that will say, for $500, we can put you on this yes. book that we yes. send out to all the yes. federal agencies. We don't look at those. And I will tell anybody who sends one out to you, I will stand in front of them and say, did you tell them to throw that in the trash? And I went, yes, I did. <laughs> because everything you need to do to sell to the federal government is free. If you get anything that asks for money, just like this women's certification program we're going to be talking about, when it first came out, we had companies, very legit, for $1,000 we will teach you how to fill out your paperwork, submit it to SBA. Oh, and by the way, we're giving you a brown paper bag lunch. <laughs> and I'm going, really? I just did a class for Tim for three hours and it was free and told him the exact same thing. If anyone's asking for money, it's not from the federal government, you need to throw it in the trash. Okay? I'm just telling you because it happens all the time, every single day. Don't get scammed by these people. Thank okay. You, I appreciate that. Okay, so we have about uh, nine, ten more minutes with the panel, and so I'm going to ask. I know it's going very fast. We go to 11:20, so. Yes, so we are going to be asking. We want the audience to ask questions. Great. So, um, Paula, and I'm going to ask this of, of uh, Paula and Stephanie. What is the biggest lesson that you learned um, from uh, starting the business? So it kind of goes in the realm of all the forms and all the legalities to doing business with the government. But if you're going to go, I think, this is personal, I don't know who will <laughs> agree with me, but you're not going to get a contract no matter how you do it without knowing the person that you're submitting it to. So if it's, if we have a contract in Alabama, we need a contracting officer, we need the small business person there, we had our SBA person. So we knew someone before we went after it. Focus on that. But the biggest lessons learned. In, in government, it's a little bit different because they almost force you to sign all the documents. But when you're in there talking about your product or service, document, document, document. Take notes, yes. follow your notes, so that when it comes back and Valerie says, no, I said I was gonna pay you $2, and I say, no, you said two fifty. dollars in a 10 years, 50 cents can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So document what, your, what your, your notes are, file them away, keep them in a safe place, but and get it in writing. It's a little different for the government because they almost force you to get, you know, do all the paperwork, but things can slip by a year later when it's time for your renewal and they come back and say, oh, well, this has happened and you haven't done this, but I've been doing it for a year. Document it. That's the biggest lesson we've learned is, is make sure to keep all of your things in writing, save it so that you can produce it at a later time. Okay. Go home this afternoon at four o'clock on 609 on Comcast and watch an episode of Judge Judy. <laughs> and I tell this to my small businesses, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Yes. Yeah. Be aware. Right, so, and in government contracting, only the contracting officer can modify your contract. So it's your responsibility to know that your technical customer, the program manager, the guy your inter employees are interfacing with every day, they don't have the authority to tell you to do something outside the scope of your contract even if they think that they do. And if they tell you to do something and you do it, that is not the government's responsibility, that's your responsibility to know those rules. So um, that's one of the lessons learned, I would say. The other is in federal contracting, and we do business with the DOD and with NASA primarily, um, that what we call our capture process, the time that you spend investing in an opportunity before you actually submit a proposal, 
That's a long process. It's a year and a half on a regular, ongoing basis of visiting, learning what's going on on the current, a lot of the contracts are recompeted, right? About every five years, we do a lot of service contracts. Um, so those are recompeted for those services. And you have to spend a year and a half getting to know that customer. What do they like? What, what is the current incumbent doing? You've got to know your customer, you've got to know your competition, and you've got to know what your capabilities are that you can bring to do it better. So it, ta it takes a long time. It's part of building that champion that I sort of talked about early on. You can start doing that early. The other thing I would say um, that you don't really realize when you're going into it is once, you're, once you get that contract, your performance on that contract is really your capture for the next follow-on because you know that work's going to be recompeted 99% of the time. Usually it stays together in the same contract form. Some pieces might come and go. Some contracts get bundled, some get broken up. But your performance during that time is the start of your proposal for your next follow-on. Um, and you get award fee scores or you get um, CPARs or weighted fee graded and evaluated, but your um, evaluations on that work can be looked at by any contracting officer. Yes, yes. So and if I'm doing another bid and I'm that. submitting two or three contracts that I think give me good past performance, but I have one, I did a terrible job over here and I had terrible performance, that CO who's evaluating can go look at any contract that I've had performance evaluations on. So um, not only do you want to do great in your proposals and put your best foot forward, but your performance has to be stellar as well. So that's one of our... Can I add yeah. something just yeah. very sure. practical that happened two months ago? So we were on a government contract in Alabama for uh, nine years, and we graduated from the 8A, but about the CPARs, we, when we were Explain trying to, what, CPARs uh, is. what is it, performance, uh, contractor performance, contractor performance assessment, assessment, right. assessment. It's, you're right, <laughs> right? Your CPAR, yeah. okay, your evaluation as a contractor, right? So we were bidding with another 8A, right, because we graduated from the 8A plan, but in that, we presented our CPARs, and they were exceptional ratings, uh, I think that's the term for the first uh, six years. This last three years, it went down to, I want to say, good. Okay? Exceptional good. Six years, and then what happened? The great one, let's say, document, is we had an email that I remember that, um, I don't remember his rank, but from the base there, came in and told all of his contracting officers, we will not have exceptional ratings anymore. You have to earn that. You know, you, you, you'll start at the good level in this. So I had that documented, and in our presentation for the next contract, he brought the contracting officer and said, well, I see your CPAR ratings went from exceptional to good, six years, and I, I was ready. I said, yes, sir. I said, in this year, we had it documented that no one would be receiving this. And he was like, oh, wow, didn't know that. Okay, thanks. I had the same thing happen. Same new thing. to the base, new person, so, but I had it documented. I don't know why, I just, it just looked bad. Exceptional to good, so. They're important, but we were able to at least say, this is what happened at you that You changed point. the definition of the so assessment. That yeah. is huge. It was huge for us. So, so Tim, anything that you want to say um, uh, about using your services? Um, I've already highlighted uh, the essential parts in regard to how to become a client of ours through our website. Uh, I'm hoping everybody had a chance to write it down. You know, think of us as a, as a one-stop shop for anything relating to government procurement. And when I say government procurement, I mean local, state, and federal. Uh, registration, when, when you talk about cost of doing business with government, there, there's always an exception to the rule, and some of you are probably familiar with this, but doing business with the state of Texas, in order to register to do business with them on their centralized master bidders list, they do charge a nominal annual fee of $70. But the value you get with that is that's how you get notified of state agency opportunities. Because if you're not registered with the CMDL, you won't get any email notifications of opportunities in that regard. So that's the only exception. You know, I've been doing this a long time, and they are the only government agency I've ever come across that's ever charged to register to do business with them. If you're not registered, it does not mean you cannot do business with them. It's not like the federal government. Uh, Valerie said you have to be registered in SAM. Well, you have to be registered and active in SAM. So that's, that's a key uh, requirement there. You can be registered and, and be a work in progress or be expired or, or be somewhere else besides active, but you have to be active in SAM to win a federal government contract. 
It's not the same with the state of Texas. Uh, you can still want a contract if, if you choose not to pay that fee. It just becomes incumbent up upon you to go out to the electronic state business daily and do one-time searches, which can become a cumbersome <coughs> process periodically. You always want to put the systems to work for you. You know, just to, just to add to a little bit, if there's time for it, in regard to things you can do, you know, there are two types of government contractors primarily. You've got reactive and you've got proactive. The reactive contractors are the ones that complete all the registrations, the email notifications are coming in, they're going through their email notifications and they react to the opportunities. You can win contracts doing that, okay? We see it all the time. The proactive contractor has that reactive phase going on because you have to do that, you have to monitor those emails, but they develop a marketing strategy campaign and they go out and they understand who is buying their goods and services, okay? And so we find that those companies that are on the proactive side